Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Lisa Fernandez. I'm the Associate Director here at the Yale Center for Environmental Communication and the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication, um, which is sponsoring this talk along with the Environmental Data Science Initiative at Yale. Um, we serve as the principal focus for the School of the Environment's research and training efforts in environmental communication. And um, we focus on four principal areas, research, teaching, convening, and empowering a global network of environmental scholars and journalists um, and practitioners. So we have a climate-focused news service called Yale Climate Connections that includes a short daily radio story that airs on more than 680 stations uh, in the country, and also Yale Environment 360, which offers news analysis and debate on global environmental issues. So today's event is part of our speaker series where we engage experts from different fields to examine how to address climate change through their particular lens. Um, and we're delighted today to bring you some perspectives from this, uh, from the field of you know, data science and Twitter, obviously. So just to go over a couple of logistics, the chat is closed. So please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and be aware that you only see the question that you asked. So we have folks in the background that are monitoring the questions. So your question will definitely be seen. Closed captioning is on. So if you're having any issue with audio, you should be able to read the conversation. At this point, I'd like to turn this over to my uh, great friend and colleague, Dr. Jennifer Marlin, who's the moderator for today. She's a research scientist and lecturer here at the Yale School of the Environment and the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. She studies public perceptions and responses to environmental change, particularly extreme weather events are so really relevant for today. Examples of her work include the Yale Climate Opinion Maps and a study of how hope and doubt affect climate change mobilization. And she's published over 60 peer reviewed papers in top scientific journals like Science and Nature Climate Change. And she's also been featured in publications like the New York Times and Forbes. Please go ahead, Jen. Thank you so much, Lisa. And thank you all for tuning in today. Really happy to have you here and very, very excited to welcome our speaker today, Jim Moffitt. He is a staff engineer on the developer relations team at Twitter. So he's from an engineering background uh, and he uses code examples, documentation, blog posts, presentations, um, and to further his mission of helping developers find their data signals and um, their data signals of interest on Twitter. So before Twitter, Jim developed software for real-time weather monitoring and flood warning systems. So that is really in his wheelhouse and his expertise uh, that he's gonna be talking to you today about. And he has stayed involved with the early warning community by advocating and demonstrating how to use Twitter for real-time communication and data exchange. Um, and so just one note before we get started here, we, many of us, many of you have a lot of questions right now about Twitter. Um, just as a reminder, uh, Jim is from the engineering side, not legal or comms or, or uh, policy or anything. So please use your brain power during the talk to think about your questions related to extreme weather um, and Jim's area of expertise. That's what he's gonna be able to speak to most um, at the end during the Q&A. So with that, thank you so much. And we would like to welcome you, Jim. Well, thank you. And I will start up my screen sharing. I assume, can you all see my screen? Yes, indeed. Okay. Uh, yeah, hi everybody. My name is Jim Moffitt uh, and I am on the Twitter developer relations team. Uh, I'm gonna be presenting today and listening to Twitter conversations of interest. Uh, I, kind of a general theme here, I'm going to be talking a lot about flood warning in particular, uh, but also um, I want to just impart that like the, the methods and the whys and the hows that I'm talking about in terms of this use case are generally, app, you know, will apply to other use cases as well. Uh, I want to confirm you can see my title page. Is that 
So we can see your whole desktop, I think. Um, Let me and... reshare. Okay. Um, So we see like a little blue screen to the left of your title screen as well. Okay, okay, that's fine, great. Okay, okay. Um, okay thank you. I just wanna make sure you got through that. Um, so this, this talk will start with a focus on a uh, discussion of the intersection between Twitter and flood warning systems. And this is really my favorite Twitter data use case and a little more background there. Uh, before working with Twitter data and the data services that deliver it, I spent a long time developing software for flood warning systems. And these systems, systems are based on collecting real-time weather data, and they have the job of displaying that data and providing ways, importantly, to alarm and notify on the state of that data. So we'll dig into how Twitter can enhance and extend those type of systems and how Twitter's core characteristics make that possible. And beyond flood warning systems, we'll explore how Twitter has been used uh, during for other types of extreme weather. And we'll discuss some research focused on analyzing social media conversations about climate change. And I also wanna note that we have, we've prepared a doc that has relevant links that will relate to the content I present. So you can use this to more easily find the tools I'm talking about. There's links to academic papers that are related to this content. Um, here's what that view looks like. If you haven't opened it, it's just a simple uh, doc with lots of links in it. So we're gonna kick off by digging into the intersection of uh, flood warning systems and the Twitter platform. And going back to 2013, I've presented many times about this mashup, this, this intersection of Twitter and flood warning systems. And that content is really involved in, into two sections. One is simply, why would I ever in, integrate something like Twitter into something like this? And of course, the other half is, how would I integrate uh, Twitter into my early warning system? And we'll start off by focusing on the why, and then later we'll take a deep dive into the hows. So a little, little back, more background here. So I started working with Twitter data almost 10 years ago. And given my history with flood warning systems, I did want to mash up rain and flood and tweet data. And I wanted to better understand back in 2012, 2013, whether users were already organically using Twitter to communicate about floods and other extreme weather. Does rainfall drive more tweets? Do people tweet in the rain? Uh, so back in 2013, I worked with 10 public agencies that operate flood warning systems, including agencies in Boulder, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Louisville, Kentucky, and a few more. I asked them to nominate one or two significant rain events that caused flooding, and we compiled data from rain gauges from those metropolitan centers. And then we compared that rain data with the hourly number of tweets. So here's a visual description of what we were comparing. On the left is a classic tipping bucket. It's a rain gauge. It measures every one millimeter of rain and transmits a data signal in real time. And our goal was to assess whether the public was already using Twitter to share observations about these flood and rain events. Of particular interest were tweets with photos and video. That's where we get into crowdsourcing, where if people are sharing photos and videos during the event, um, Emergency operations uh, can maybe better understand what's going on on the ground. So we geo-referenced tweets uh, with any tweet geo provide, provided by the user, but we also scan the tweet messages for geo-references. Here I just show four sample tweets that were from a rain event in Vegas back in August of 2012. And keep in mind, back in 2012, that's 10 years ago, the, the network of Twitter was much smaller. And here's one example from Las Vegas. This is from a 2012 storm that caused local flooding, property damage, and one death. And the, the public, or I'm sorry, the blue bars are hourly rainfall amounts. And the red line shows the hourly tweets that were geotagged Las Vegas that matched our rain and flood type queries. The gray, the gray line, which is really hard to see at the bottom, sorry about that, uh, is the daily chatter that matched our queries from the week before. So it's just a way to segregate, like what's a normal sunny day chatter on Twitter about the weather compared to one that's happening during an event. 
And this helps illustrate the number of rain and flood tweets that, and that they spiked during the event. We did this same analysis for 11 other events and the, the results were similar. So we put together a series of blog posts to discuss that yes, the public was already using Twitter back in 2012 to talk about specific weather events and that the volume of tweets seemed to increase with the volume of water. We also blogged about how public agencies could integrate Twitter networks, uh, the Twitter network to listen for tweets of interest and to extend the reach of their public conversations. And I also started going back to hydrology and flood warning conferences. And when I first started showing up at these conferences back in 2013, this was a common question I heard. Like, what is somebody, somebody from Twitter showing up at this hydrology conference? Well, luckily there was an interesting story to tell. Um, and this was really the foundation of the message about how the core characteristics of Twitter make it such a good match for being an extension of flood warning systems. That these core char characteristics make Twitter a compelling public safety communication channel. Twitter is happening, is what ha is happening right now. That's been a marketing tagline for a while, but it still rings true. And I wanna dem do my first demo. One thing during this uh, next hour, uh, I'm gonna attempt uh, several demos and this will be my first one. And what this demo uh, is gonna show is just the lack of latency on the Twitter network. So I'm gonna switch screens here. Can you see my blue screen now? And what yeah. I'm, doing, I'm doing here, this is a, if you're in the software at all, I'm working on a Mac and I'm using this utility called curl. It just helps you uh, make HTTP requests, API requests. So what I'm doing here is I'm initiating a real-time stream. I'm gonna log in authenticate. And behind the scenes, I have, let's see, okay, I got a 200. So I didn't, I got my password, right? That's a good sign. Um, so what this is doing, I have a rule set up here in the background. I'm listening for any tweets with a special hashtag. And I'm going to send out a tweet now. And the whole point of this demo is just when I hit the tweet button, is just noticing how quickly it shows up in my streaming software. So I have this tweet set up demonstrating the speed of the Twitter network with Yale uh, with Yale's climate communication handle. And I have this hashtag uh, Twitter dev demo, which is what I'm listening for. And I, I'm gonna hit uh, tweet right now and boom, there it is. Uh, so in terms of lack of latency, uh, the Twitter network really shines. So when I first started working with Twitter data and, and systems like this, I was kind of taken back and just that about that lack of latency and flood warning systems and other early warning systems, of course, time is, is, uh, uh, is everything. And to know that you can listen for tweets of interest from around the world and receive them uh, within seconds, it was uh, eye-opening to me when I first started. So I'm gonna stop this stream and we'll move on. So success with the first demo, that's always a good sign. Oh, let me... Uh, continue on here. So we're talking about the core characteristics and these are the type of things that really resonate with a crowd who's interested in building flood warning systems. Uh, one, obviously the Twitter is a public network, public tweets, and you can essentially use it to publicly broad broadcast your message. There's also a, a private direct messages layer. So if you're in a situation where maybe you wanna exchange information about a flood rescue or, or other personal information, there's that available as well. The other of course is that it's extremely real time as I just demonstrated. Uh, another is that it's mobile focused, of course, concise con content, you're gonna be able to have an audience that's out and about with their phones. Maybe they're in the middle of an event, maybe they, they can use their phone to share information. Another that Twitter obviously is built for sharing information and media. I mean, that's sort of its core purpose. Uh, in this case, you could be sharing data and graphs and links to other portals. Um, maybe you live in a county that has an emergency management system that it gets activated during a flood. You could be directed to that. Uh, also, of course, Twitter it has support for many kinds of notifications, and that's why you build things like flood warning systems. It's about that last mile of getting notifications out to the public. And of course, there's an API for automating and, 
and building systems where you can automate a lot of these listening techniques and also broadcasting techniques. So by later, um, I, as I mentioned, uh, when I was doing those correlations between rain gauges and, and storms and specific tweets, uh, there was a lot of content there. So uh, we put out a series of blog posts about it. Uh, I mentioned that. And we, for part three of this blog post, we published it on uh, in September uh, 11th, or yes, I think September 12th, 2013. And by later that night, we were in the just the start of the 2013 Colorado flood. Uh, I still have colleagues who are pretty superstitious about me publishing and blogging about this topic because it was just eerie how we uh, were just kind of wrapping up our blog series. We hit post on a noon on a, I can't remember, maybe a Thursday. And later that night, we were already getting into the one of the most historic floods in Colorado. This is just a kind of a random uh, weather service uh, de depiction of the seven day rain totals over Colorado. Uh, not far outside of Boulder, we got 17 inches of rain in one week. And if you're familiar at all with this region of uh, out here in Colorado, that's not far away from our annual rainfall. So it was pretty intense. Um, you know, 10 people died, 18,000 people were displaced, 1,800 homes and 200 businesses were completely destroyed. Uh, we had 30 state bridges destroyed, tons of roads were wrecked. Uh, economically, it was a $4 billion event. And for this round, um, we, we, we wanted to also, uh, so because of the flood, we decided we would have yet another round of analysis that focused on this particular event. And we did another mashup of, of rain and tweet data that yielded some more interesting results. I'll show those next. Well, first, I just want to share tweets like this were coming out in real time. I mean, I live here, so I was glued to my Twitter feed. And I've, I had already done some work with Boulder OEM, the Office of Emergency Management. And when I saw messages like this coming out that night, uh, you know, it was obvious that we were in for a world of hurt. Uh, here's kind of a, it's probably hard to read this, but this is sort of a data mashup of this Boulder flood, this Colorado flood. The top is hourly rainfall. Again, we had 15 to 17 inches at many gauges around our city. Uh, the middle plot there is, is Boulder Creek, which runs right down the middle of Boulder. And, you know, we definitely hit the major flooding thresholds. And the plot below is just the tweets per hour that were coming out. And we hit times with uh, over 5,500 tweets about the Boulder flood uh, per hour. So uh, there was a lot of chatter, a lot of dialogue, a lot of uh, crowdsourcing going on during this event. And the thing that we learned, and it's kind of common sense, but it's interesting to actually see it manifest itself in data is, you know, one key thing about Twitter uh, and how to use it effectively during these events is to uh, direct the public to the Twitter accounts that really are managing the situation on the ground. Here we have uh, information from the, at the federal level. We had our local uh, FEMA region tweeting about it. We had our Colorado uh, Emergency Management Office tweeting about it. And of course, we had local cities tweeting about it. But one common thing here is they're directing the public to follow the Boulder OEM and the National Weather Service office in Boulder. Like if you wanna really know what's going on, up to minute updates, here's where you should go. And this is a kind of another interesting data mashup I found as a result of looking at this. So again, this is the total rainfall, accumulated rainfall at a gauge in downtown Boulder. So really not far from the office I work at where it got over 14 inches in just a few days. And what you see here is the, the amount of new followers to the Boulder OEM and the National Weather Service handle, which just illustrates that your audience can be quite dynamic. You may not have many followers uh, at the start of a storm, but if you have been working with your partners and other uh, cooperators, and you know there's a general knowledge of, of of who should be get referred to during these events. It can just show how the power, I mean, this audience of theirs, and this is probably mostly a local audience, 
uh, grew significant, significantly during the event. And you can kind of see how the shape of, as we got more and more rain, that more and more followers were, were uh, tuning into this situation. So now uh, let's take a world tour of flood warning systems. Um, let me go back for a second. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna show some example apps that help illustrate how floods unfold on Twitter. Uh, we're going to explore a crowdsourced warning, a flood warning system in Jakarta. And we're just going to show some examples of other systems that broadcast weather and rain, rain gauge data. Uh, and these are what I'd call very good bots, bots that have an important role of disseminate, uh, disseminating real-time information. I want to start with this. This is probably the most simple uh, Twitter bot you can build around weather. And what I love about this example is built by a former colleague who is a, he designs flood warning systems out in the East. And he came to me and said, hi, I, I wanna automate the, the readings from a local weather station and publish them on Twitter for the public to consume. And what's cool about that is he's a genius with working out in the field and building these monitoring systems, but really was not much of a web developer or a, a developer at all. Uh, but with not a lot of help from me, he was able to automate a, a Twitter account that, you know, on his base station, he'd be collecting data from this weather site and then quickly turning around and posting it on Twitter. So it's all just to say that it's really quite simple uh, to build these tweet bots that uh, can be connected to incoming weather data. And this is just another simple example, just illustrating that. Hey, a tweet, yeah, it's 280 characters, but you can embed images. Uh, you, if you wanted, you could embed lots of data rich uh, charts and graphs, uh, and that it doesn't just have to be a bunch of words, obviously. And the beauty of that is that this is some pseudocode, basically. This is Ruby, but it's just showing that, you know, in maybe 30 lines of code, that's all it takes to automate and publish uh, a tweet like this. Uh, soon after the Boulder flood, uh, a colleague and I, a data scientist that I work with, we spent some time building sort of a, a viewer of, of how this flood unfolded in our city. So we collected and geo-referenced as many tweets as we could. Uh, we are very focused on tweets with video and, and, um, and, and photos. And we built a simple tool, just a kind of a prototype where you could move through the storm temporarily. You could click around and see the types of information uh, that people were sharing. And I'll say, I, after the flood, I, I attended a few flood warning conferences and really just had a session where we walked through this uh, prototype just to uh, really teach the audience about the amazing type of information that was coming out in real time. If you wanted to truly understand what was going on, on the ground, I, I was pleasantly surprised how many people were geotagging and, and leaving and, and posting photos and videos. Uh, here's another example. This is a little bit more mature example. example. I want to um, click to this. This is like the real-time version of it. But what we did is we went back to Hurricane Harvey in 2017 and collected uh, around a million public tweets that were posted during this period. And we built this tool to help us understand just again, like what type of content was coming out uh, in the moment uh, with this thing, you can, you can click around and move through the storm. And one reason we did this, we, we wanted to understand the type of conversations that were happening on Twitter in real time. And we uh, segregated them into the categories that really like jumped out at us. One was, you know, the information just about about the hurricane itself. These are messages coming out for, from the National Weather Service, from the Hurricane Center, et cetera. Uh, we also, we focused on what was coming out in terms of crowdsourcing, what types of pictures and videos were people sharing. Uh, another one was, you know, uh, or SOS tweets, like, oh, we see a family on a roof at a house, can somebody help rescue these folks? And as you know, there's tons of volunteers coming into the region with boats and helping those rescues happen. Uh, animals was another huge theme. Uh, obviously, there's livestock all over outside of Houston, but obviously people worried about animals, their pets, 
Um, and then, of course, there was the theme of recovery. Uh, Twitter was uh, instrumental in helping organize the community afterwards. Like, we need volunteers. If you want to donate, here's some sources. Uh, so uh, that was a neat exercise to really uh, go back and, and, and better understand how this hurricane unfolded on Twitter. Uh, here's yet another example. This is sort of like the one I showed before, but there's a system in England where they have uh, 3,200 river gauges that each have their own Twitter account. So the beauty of that is uh, you can follow a gauge that's near maybe where you live, work, commute, whatever, and you can follow that tweet. And when it floods, uh, you'll get information on your Twitter feed from it. And to get a better view of what that looks like, here is a, they set up a, a kind of a master web, web view where you could click into these different stations. You could discover where they were. Uh, I will say this project had its challenges. It's really not easy to create 3,200 Twitter accounts. Uh, they obviously had to work uh, with some of our teams to get permission to do this. You can't automate the creation of accounts, for example. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's kind of a novel system in terms of having done that work. And then again, providing the public a way to follow a local gauge right on Twitter. Uh, and here's yet another example. This is work done by the USGS in, at the Austin uh, Water Science Center. Um, what they have done is they have created two Twitter accounts, one around rain gauge data, another one around uh, river gauge, gauge data. And the cool thing is they're only tweeting to this, these accounts when it's flooding. They work with the National Weather Service. Uh, you know, they're depending on their models in terms of this rainfall could, will likely trigger local flooding here. Uh, so on this, uh, Twitter feed, USGS underscore Texas rain, you'll get just rain gauges who are uh, prompting these models to go in the flood stage. Uh, and again, there's a separate account where um, it's connected to river gauges that are in flood stage. And then on, really on top of that, they built what they call the Texas water dashboard sort of a clearinghouse. You can cut, and these links are in the handout that we provided. So you can click, there is a section there, you can go see this yourself. But what they do here is they use uh, these Twitter feeds to disseminate this live real-time flood data to their cooperators, to, to other researchers, to universities, to TV stations, uh, anyone who's focused in on a, on a storm. And as you may know, Texas on an annual basis has terrible rainstorms. So they've done some really novel work there as well. And now we're going to go to Jakarta uh, in Indonesia. Um, and what we have here is, you know, the conditions in Jakarta are a perfect storm for annual floods. I mean, first hydraulically, uh, more than I think seven or around seven rivers flow into the Jakarta Delta. And Jakarta is a lot like New Orleans in respect to having areas that are below sea level. And second, socially, the use of Twitter and other social media networks is off the charts. And these condi conditions make chart, uh, Jakarta a perfect place uh, to build a crowdsourced flood warning system. So this Betabakana organization, it's a research foundation that has helped create a web crowdsourcing system for hazards uh, in Indonesia. And we worked with some smart city researchers there uh, to build this uh, Twitter-driven crowdsource system. Uh, the system listens for tweets coming into their account, and if that tweet does not include an exact location by the user, they would respond back uh, to say, hey, thank you for the flood report, but we need to know where you are so we can sh share it with, with uh, the rest of the public. And this display here shows the, the the geotag tweets that they consumed in the first, uh, well, from 2013 to 2014. So you can, if you look closely, I don't know if you can see the details, but you can see major uh, roads and, and uh, routes throughout the city. That black line is sort of the city limits, the, the ocean is to the north, the river basin is uh, to the south. Um, unfortunately, though, the Twitter mobile app stopped supporting users from sharing their exact location via their phone. Uh, but the good news is that the Twitter platform can be used in creative ways 
And what in their case, what they did is they just built their own app. So they still have this mechanism where people say, hey, it's flooding where I am. And they automatically respond, say, that's, uh, that's good. Uh, do you want to share a flood report? And with that, they get a link to this mobile app that they developed, which does allow the user to precisely indicate where they are, plus has these other features where they can you know, indicate how deep the water is using these kind of innovative graphics. Uh, and there's also places to share photos and videos and things like that. And if you go to this, again, this link is in the, in the doc we shared. If you go there, there's this uh, kind of, you know, a map. And that's the real, real value of this system is not only sent, they're centralizing the collection of these reports, but they're also turning around and sharing them on public maps. And one thing they've really done really successful for the system is their public education. Uh, they've done an amazing job of let, letting the public know that the system exists and also teaching the, the public how to use it. I mean, they've done all kinds of cooperating with other public agencies, student groups. They've had celebrity and sports stars in the region, like do PSAs about the system. They've done taxi advertisements. I mean, they, early on, they did a great job of just letting the public know that this system exists. You can help contribute to public safety. And even if you're not uh, submitting flood reports, there are public uh, websites where you can see in the moment what's happening. And recently they are uh, expanding the system. They're doing a pilot in the Philippines. And I know there's some other areas in Southeast Asia where uh, they're looking to expand this. And the one beautiful thing about this is it's based on public source uh, software. And uh, looking at this system is a great segue into our next topic. So last fall, I had the opportunity to work with some of our largest data partners and and help tell some extreme weather stories and again, how they unfolded on Twitter. And we launched an extreme weather campaign in late September of last year. And if I remember, I think that was sort of the genesis of this talk today was that campaign. Uh, we selected four events and we worked with a, a web design firm to build visualizations for them and use tweets to help tell the story of these events. Uh, the, the Google Doc uh, includes links to these visualizations. Uh, they're pretty cool and you can move temporally through the storm and, and you can uh, see how the Twitter conversation evolved. I'm not gonna like load these up right now in this presentation, but I highly recommend you check them out. I mean, if nothing else, the visuals are, and the way they uh, tell the story is quite interesting. And I, do, I am gonna walk through at a high level the four events. Uh, the first one is in fact, this partner of ours, Beta Bacana in Jakarta. And the event that we that they built this visualization for is from January of 2020 when they had record breaking rainfall and uh, in, inundated the city. Uh, as is often with these annual storms, it was more water than their infrastructure could handle. Uh, severe flooding affected large parts of the city, uh, injuring dozens, displacing thousands, blocked roads, shut down one of the airports, cut off electricity. And in the first week of January 2020, there were over 20,000 tweets made in Jakarta about the floods. And these are like active flood reports being submitted to the system. Uh, another event we looked at was looking at the Texas freeze. Uh, as you all probably remember back uh, February of 2021, uh, there were three winter storms, including a polar vortex, uh, caused massive electrical failure, failures in Texas due to rare freezing temperatures. Uh, the conversation around this, this particular visualization focuses on the conversation around the hashtags Texas freeze, Texas snow, and hashtag Texas power outages, and included more than 186,000 tweets, uh, which received over 625,000 engagements and had a total reach of more than uh, 800 million impressions. So. Uh, that was obviously a huge event that, you know, you could use Twitter to help understand what was happening in real time. Again, I encourage you to, to follow that link I shared and to click through the, uh, the event uh, through the visualization. Uh, and then next up, we had Typhoon uh, Hajibis. In 2019, northern Japan was hit by a devastating typhoon. Uh, generated three feet of rain in 24 hours in some regions, lots of flash floods, uh, 74 people died. Uh, 
you know, the typhoons, heavy rains caused more than 20 rivers in, in Japan to overflow quickly. Uh, and inhabitants were, you know, forced to leave their homes for higher ground. And, and during the Japanese typhoon, people, you know, turned to many networks, but also turned to tw Twitter to share their experiences. And uh, the, the tweet volume around this event uh, increased 34%. Um, I don't know if you know, but Japan is a huge adopter of Twitter. There's been amazing, like, fundamental research there about the speed of the network when it comes to earthquakes uh, and, and finding that Twitter as earthquake detection system is actually quite effective. Uh, if you're interested in the mashup of uh, uh, Twitter as a social media service and uh, early warning systems, there's just a wealth of uh, information and research that's been done in Japan. Um, the last event we looked at is from Australia. I mean, I'm sure you're very familiar with the, the terrible bushfires they've experienced, especially back in 2020. Uh, you know, from June of 19, uh, June of 2019 to March of 2020, fires in Australia burned 13.6 million acres in New, New South Wales alone. Uh, on Twitter, over 2.8 million people around the world engaged in conversations to keep up to date on what was happening there. And together, there were nearly 10 million public tweets related to the bushfires from just December of uh, 2019 to March of 2020. So now I want to highlight um, some work that we highlighted at Twitter that, that's around understanding public tweets to better understand public conversations and their sentiment around climate change. And, you know, we'll, we'll describe some work uh, done by the folks at the University of California Davis and the Max Planck Institute, uh, which I believe is uh, based in, in Germany. Uh, these groups collaborated on using around a billion historical tweets to better understand public conversations and sentiment around climate change. And they focused on better understanding how the US public adjusts to climate change and how new normals affect their reactions and sentiment. Uh, they found, not surprisingly, uh, that many of us have a three to four year timeline for adjusting to new normals. Uh, I find that happening in Colorado. We have terrible a terrible uh, fire season now. Um, you know, I'd say 10 years ago, it wasn't anything like it is now, um, but now like we're almost getting used to like, oh yeah, it's, it's a year round event, not just a seasonal thing. Um, so we highlighted this work as part of a Twitter data, quote unquote, su success story blog series. And the Google doc includes links to this series where you can find some of the other examples uh, one includes how real-time tweets are used to measure consumer sentiment and, you know, using that to model stock prices, for example. And it's a good place to start if you're interested in other non-weather related examples. And again, uh, hope, hope you have your hands on that Google Doc because there's quick links to all of that, including uh, related to this work done by these folks, uh, included links to three academic papers that came out of their work. Uh, I read them last week, actually, sitting on a train in California. Um, but this one kind of particularly stood out for me because uh, it kind of relates to work I had done before about trying to mash up, you know, gauge data with, with tweet volumes. In this case, uh, they studied tweets coming from 22 counties along the coast, including major cities like Miami, New York, Boston. Uh, anyway, coastal areas with a total population of 13 million people. Uh, and, you know, one interesting thing for me is that along that coast that they are studying, it, you know, we have 3,700 miles of coast making up the eastern and Gulf seaboards, yet there are only 132 tidal gauge stations with long-term records. So what they are attempting to do was to sort of interpolate between those locations of gauges and their, their signal of interest was how many people were commenting on, on high water events and could they correlate that back with the rain gauges and then use this technique to sort of fill in the gaps between these rain gauges. The theory being that you could listen uh, for tweets uh, related to that topic of rising water, of local floods, maybe some road blockages, and could you use that to interpolate what's going on between this rather sparse collection of tide gauges. 
the, the papers I linked uh, in that doc, I, I found very interesting and highly encourage you to check them out. So now I want to shift to, you know, how do you get started with the, the Twitter API? Um, and we'll spend the next uh, around 15 minutes digging into that. One, one thing I want to start with, of course, I'm going to click to our documentation. I mean, uh, if you're a developer, if you're learning to code, uh, this is the place to start. If you go to our document documentation homepage, you're going to see three different areas. We'll be talking about the Twitter API here. If you come in here, and there are a couple of things. One, there's a link to sign up to, to get. You need to have an approved developer account. It's a quick process. If you're a hobbyist or somebody learning to code, uh, you should be able to get an account within a few minutes. Uh, if you're an academic researcher or you're building a business on Twitter data, there's a little bit more um, information we'll want to get about your use cases, etc. Uh, there's information here you can find at a high level. We have different tiers of access. Uh, we have essential and elevated access, as we call them. They're completely free. Uh, with these, you can build, a, you can uh, set up a, a Twitter app, and with that, you get authentication tokens that you can then turn around and make your requests with. Uh, with the elevator, for example, you can pull up to two million tweets per month. Uh, we also have, uh, which may resonate with this audience, is an academic research tier. It's really tailored towards graduate students and research research groups. Uh, one important thing it provides is access to what we call our full archive search, where, which, as the name implies, you can go back and pull data uh, you know, from the first tweet back in 2006. I will say um, the focus of my content today is all around our new version of this API, which we first started launching back in the summer of 2020, and we're on a really... Uh, big or fast cadence of, of releasing new things. Uh, if you go here, um, you'll find all the different types of endpoints out there. And I'll just show one. I'm going to be talking a lot about search. Uh, search is the thing where you, you submit a query and then you get back pages and pages of tweets that match your query. But here, I just want to highlight, if you get into our documentation, they all kind of follow the same format. There's an introduction page. There's a quick start page where if you're, again, learning just maybe the Twitter API for the first time, or maybe you're new to, to coding, uh, it's a great place to start. Uh, we have, you know, depending on the endpoint, we have different guides. Um, there's an API reference where if you're already ready to roll, you're already developing and using other APIs, this is probably the go-to place to, 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 to get our documentation. Um, let me talk about a few other things. One thing I really want to, I'm happy to show, we have just recently, we've launched some new, what I'd call no code solutions. Uh, and what they do is here, I can show this live. But um, what they do is this, all you need to use this is a Twitter uh, account. Basically, you'd, you'd click in and give, um, give your, give us the permission of your, your Twitter account to use this tool. And here I'm just, uh, I'm looking, my, my user ID, for example, is this number and I can hit click. And I see it, it instantly gives you back an idea of what the JSON response is. Uh, and that's an important thing to know that all of the responses from our uh, endpoints will be in JSON. Uh, but you can do other things here, like maybe I wanna show, um, when that tweet was, or when this user created their account. Um, here, let me show something here. Maybe you're interested in public metrics of an account. That's one thing new with our version two is like you have full control over what you're asking, what payload you want to return. Um, let's see what my location, my public location is set to. Um, so anyway, and, uh, and another great thing about this is you can use any of our endpoints. I'm now I'm going to go back to recent search, and I want to I want to do a quick. My query is I want climate change mentions, and there's an operator for I only want original tweets. I don't want to pull back retweets. I just want the original content, and maybe I only want to pull back tweets that have videos or photos. I can run this. 
you can see that the payload has changed. Now I just have a, a list of 10 different um, tweets that came back. I can change that and say, no, actually I wanna get hundred back per response. Uh, another thing you can do is you can, I may say, I want, I wanna know more about the authors of these tweets. And in the tweet fields themselves, you can pick a long list of these things. Uh, I picked a bunch now, I'm gonna hit run. And you'll see here, it's created those fields I asked for. If you go down to the bottom, there'll be an includes uh, JSON array, which will tell you all about the users that you've uh, pulled back. And this is a paginating system. Uh, so it only re returns one page at, at a time. It's like using Google, uh, Google search or something like that, where you get the first set of results and you can click through and get more. Uh, so let's continue and show you some other tools. This uh, next one I'm excited about, this is for our, uh, you, get, you need to be part of our academic tier to use this, but once you're there, um, it's just a great tool. Here I'm gonna do again, I'm, here is what the user interface looks like. I'm saying I want tweets that mention hurricane or flood. And again, I just want original tweets and I only want tweets with uh, photos and video. And what's special about this is I'm saying, I wanna go back to 2017 during Hurricane Harvey and pull in tweets that are coming from that. I hit continue and it says, okay, you're, gonna, you're about to pull back 28,091 tweets. Do you wanna do that in case I do? Uh, you can save it locally to your hard drive. I'm just going to do test. And it starts running. And this might take a while, but the beautiful thing about this is like, as an academic researcher, you don't necessarily have to use code to get in here and interact. You can use a tool like this. And at the end of the day, you're, you're able to pull down public tweets and, and run off and do your analysis on them. So let me, I also wanna highlight our, our Twitter dev GitHub repository. You're gonna find all kinds of great resources up there. Uh, if you're learning the Twitter API version two, uh, we have this repository of sample code and you can see this long list of what we call endpoints that we've already launched on version two. Uh, again, I talk a lot about search, if I click in there, uh, this is just a repository of a really simple example code in these five different languages, uh, Java, there's examples in R, JavaScript, Python, and Ruby. If I click into one of these, you're going to see how it, it is. These are really simple versions, but if you are just learning the ins and outs of interacting with these endpoints, it's a great way to go. Um, what else? We also have more elaborate full on uh, clients that you can use. In this case, I'm talking about search clients. And I'll show you in a second what these bring to the table. Uh, here's one, this is one that I maintain. It's the Search Tweets Python collection. I'd say this one's been very popular with academics. Uh, I mean, Python is a very popular language for data science and, and, and backend development. Um, let me do a little demo of this. So what, what these search clients bring to the table here, I'm just using a terminal. Uh, here I'm making a call to the Ruby version. I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm calling a script called search app. Uh, my, my filter that I'm filtering on is, is just the keyword flood, again, is, it, I'm, I'm pulling original tweets and I'm looking for uh, tweets with social uh, with uh, media photos or videos. Here I'm asking for just data from the last three days, and I'm going to run it in a mode where I just want daily counts of what matches that query. So if I run this, uh, you can see. In fact, if I grab this this JSON content, and you go to some. JSON viewer, I'll just pick one, this one, there's many out there. If I, so what it does is it sends back a time series of how many tweets match that query. And this is an amazing tool because obviously if you write a very open-ended query, you could pull back literally millions of tweets and run through your 
your monthly limits say in no time. So this counts endpoint is really a way to look before you leap. Uh, I can do another call here where, you know, maybe I want 30 days of data and I want it on an hourly basis. This will bring back a lot of JSON, but there we go. So this is another way. Uh, if you actually want to bring back data uh, with this client, all you have to do is say, uh, I'm not looking for what the counts are. I actually just want the data. I'm just going to bring back, uh, let's say, two hours of, and you can use timestamps here for this parameter, but I'm just, this is a nice shorthand that this client supports. So bring me back the first two hours uh, or the last two hours of matching that rule. So even the last two hours, there's been a lot of tweets. Um, let's see exactly how many had come out. So in the last two hours, there are 885 tweets uh, that mention the word flood, have photos, and our original tweets. So I also want to show um, if, if you already are into coding, and particularly if you're into Python, I want to highlight the Python client because it's, you know, it's a great tool. Here I'm going to set up a Python virtual environment. And this just, I don't want to screw up my real working environment. So this is just, so then once you have an environment, let me activate this one, just bear with me. And you can, you know, I can show that I'm using this virtual environment. It's, it's got a path to where this environment lives. But then once you do that, this is how quickly you can get rolling with this Python Client And what's special about it is it's publicly available uh, through pip to install. So I'm going to actually do that process. So I'm going to do a couple things. One, I'm going to I'm going to pip install a package that I need to use this thing. Uh, pip install requests. Okay, now this is the magic sauce about this particular client library. I'm going to pip install uh, helps to spell it right. I'm going to go up to, it's called search tweets version two. And okay, I already had it installed, but if you hadn't, it would have installed it that fast. And then once I do that, I have this client library already installed in my system. I can do things like uh, I'm going to run the client now just to make sure that it's actually installed correctly. And it's in a subfolder called scripts. And I'm gonna just do a dash H. As you can see, there, there's, there's help. There's a lot of different options you can use for this client. Now I'm gonna, I've already, oh, I'm gonna do another example here where we're gonna actually use this thing to pull back data. Uh, I'm running this script, it's called search tweets. My query is climate change. Uh, has media is original tweet. I'm going back three hours. I've nominated some extra tweet fields I want in my results. And I'm saying I want to bring back 100 per response. And I run this thing. And this client does another nice thing for you. It automatically paginates through however many pages match your, your tweets. So in the end, I, I, I brought back about 238 tweets just, just right there. I also want to show uh, another kind of fun example uh, of this particular Python library, and that is you can run it in a polling mode. So maybe you don't want to run a real-time stream. There's a lot of challenges with running a real-time stream. You initiate the connection, and we just start sending you tweet JSON for anything that matches. Uh, but you have to maintain that connection 24-7. They, they are guaranteed to get broken at some point. You have to have code to detect that and reconnect. Rather than doing that, you can use our endpoints in a search in a polling mode where you're asking, hey, are any more tweets about this? Let me know. Any more tweets about this? Let me know. And I'm going to run this example now where I'm running this different script called poll tweets. My query is the same, but I'm asking it to ask that query to run that query every 15 seconds. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to start by going back in history just one minute. You can go back five days and then get into the, get into the polling mode. So if I run this, uh, I just got the first uh, 18 tweets, and now it's going to wait 15 seconds, and it'll run again. And it can just do that 
continually. So if you're in a monitoring situation, you can run scripts like this where uh, you are, it's almost like a real-time feed. There's a, up to a 15 second latency, but you can just run this uh, perpetually and load your database or, or your visualization, what, what have you. So I'll, I'll, I'll kill that. Um, so I think that really wraps up uh, that this content. Uh, I, there's this here. I'm showing like different links you can follow to to get uh, more information about digging into the technical side of all this. But again, in the Google Doc that we shared, uh, there's really all you need is in there. We have links to these no code tools. One I didn't show, we use a tool called Postman. It's just a library that lets you set up uh, example H HTTP calls and allows you to build a collection. And we do that on your behalf. Every time we launch a new endpoint, we update this collection. You download it, you load it into Postman, you set up your credentials, and then you're ready to roll. And you know, just to give you a sense of how it works, you can just send that here, and it renders the JSON that comes back uh, quite nicely. So it's another great tool. So with that, that's the end of our whirlwind tour of getting started with the Twitter API. And now um, we can uh, uh, do uh, some Q&A. Thank you, Jim. Wow, fantastic. Round of applause here. That was a lot of wonderful information. Really, really rich. And I am completely motivated and re-energized again. Um, and we have some good questions coming in and feel free to ask more. Um, um, bef I'm just gonna get one, one question out of the way that we all are thinking about just to get it out of our systems. How's everybody feeling today, this week at Twitter? <laughs> Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think it's a spectrum of uh, a surprise. Um, there's, I have colleagues who are extremely optimistic, others who are just questioning our future directions. I mean, it's funny, like, I don't know if it's funny, but I, I feel uh, I have a deep affection for what Twitter is and the power that it has as a public, you know, it's a public square. Uh, and, but on the other hand, it, it does reflect human nature, and and it's a we are continually addressing challenges around, you know, moderation and harassment, and um, you know, I guess one thing I'm hanging on to is this was a major investment by an individual, and it's a it's a ten to me it's a fragile thing that we built at Twitter, and. I'm hoping that um, all these changes aren't gonna you know, change the course that we're on because we certainly are on, I've seen so much progress in the last five years in terms of, I mean, our main underlying mission is how do we promote positive public communications and conversations? Um, but, you know, I, again, I wanna stress, I know very, I, I, I I know probably as much about the situation as anybody in the audience. Um, and fingers crossed that, you know, we've built this I, internally at Twitter. I, I can't think of a better place to work. Uh, I love our culture. Um, and I hope that continues. Yeah, thank you. Yes, um, ab absolutely. And, and you've just demonstrated how profoundly important some of these tools are and can be um, for dialogue and discussion and ultimately people's lives and human health. Um, and so a couple of questions here about um, the Twitter audience and how um, people receive some of this information. Um, one question is um, actually from Andy Rebkin out there. Thank you, Andy. Um, and he wants to know, are, are any of these capacities adaptable to SMS or the like? Um, when Ida slammed New York City, many residents reported getting flash flood emergency alarms on their phones, but they didn't um, yet have information on what to do based on their specific circumstances or location. Um, does that relate at all? What's the core question? I think the core question is, are any of these capacities potentially adaptable to like text messages or SMS 
Well, it's interesting because that's certainly the, you know, the origins of, of Twitter. Um, I will say that it's less compatible at that layer, um, you know, just because the service itself and the Twitter app has become so much more robust. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, certainly there's ways to connect those two types of systems uh, through automation. Uh, I think of direct messages, you know, again, that's not a simple text message, but uh, kind of modeled on the same uh, premise. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and I, I think uh, certainly not so much in the United States, but I think in other parts of the world, I think uh, there has been work to make Twitter more, uh, even more concise in terms of bandwidth uh, to, you know, to not assume that everybody has a, a super powerful phone or some other device. Um, it's kind of out of my wheelhouse, but I know there's been, given the origins of Twitter in that regard, uh, there's still, um, I'd say, support for that. Mm -hmm. Is the, and this may also be out of your wheelhouse, but this is related to some of the questions about the Twitter audience and how it's changing. Is it, do you know much about, well, I'm, I'm sure people at Twitter know, but I don't know if you know um, yeah. how the audience is is changing or trending. Um, who's listening, who isn't, is it changing much over time? The age profile, things like that. Yeah, I, I don't know much about the uh, delineations or around the demographics. I will say that, you know, even today we had an earnings call, which is sort of a interesting situation when we may be going private soon. Uh, but in that, in those numbers, you know, uh, daily active users went up 16% year to year. Mm -hmm. So we do see growth there. But mm -hmm. in particular around flood warning systems or anything around public safety, it's really, in my mind, on the onus of whoever's building that system to do their legwork to get the public to know. Mm -hmm. Like I could imagine someone who has no interest in Twitter, but they're interested because they live in a floodplain. Um, if you're going to build a system on Twitter, there's other ways off of Twitter to get your message out. Uh, we've had, you know, county uh, administrators, including blurbs in their newsletter to their constituents about, hey, did you know that we run a uh, we run a flood warning system and you can access it on our website and on Twitter. So mm -hmm. th there needs to be a lot of legwork on that side. And again, that's where, where the folks in Jakarta have really hit it out of the park, where they, they understood that early on and they knew they had this uh, potentially huge audience right in their basins. And they did the work of letting them know that this thing existed. The Yes, the, the graphics that that team have developed seemed really advanced as well. I could see like a picture of the person next to the vehicle and, you know, the slider where you can actually indicate how deep the water is. And I know I've seen some of the augmented reality videos from the Weather Channel, for example, that show people just how powerful water rising water is where you see the broadcast meteorologist standing on this platform i don't know if you've seen these and behind uh -huh. him yeah the water rises up and it shows you that only like i think it's three feet of flowing water you're starting to lift objects um including vehicles that yes. now can be mobile and floating and then they also show you the debris and everything in the water that's floating in the water toxics other things and um and that just seems incredibly powerful as well. Yeah, certainly, yeah. Yeah, um, so there's a lot of education, clearly that's happening around this. Um, our, and so um, our, well, what, another, relating to another question from the audience, um, someone is wondering um, about the geotagging of these kinds of events. And, um, you know, people are using hashtags, less frequently, how, how does that work? How do you, is that a problem? Do you have to use hashtags and, and people seem to be using them less? Is that a problem? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, on the side of geo referencing where tweets are coming from, admittedly, it's, it's a very difficult thing. Um, in terms of like a lot of people, like I work with a data partner and they half expect that we can geo reference every tweet. And that certainly is not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to be, you know, the user has to opt in and, and explicitly share their location. 
And really, depending on the use case or the type of data, it's really only one to 4% of all tweets will have that location tied to the tweet. Again, that's, that's where education comes in. Like here in Boulder County, people are encouraged, hey, if you're sharing a photo of a highway that just got inundated with water, uh, remember that you can share your location along with your photo. Because without that, we may not be able to figure out where this information is coming from. Um, what was the other part of that beyond geo? Oh, ha the use of hashtags. I mean, right. I would say like with major events, hurricanes, typhoons, that there still is a, a, a strong use of hashtags. I get a lot of questions about that. Like who decides who the hashtag is and, or what the hashtag is? And, you know, there's no, it's organic. Um, you know, I think the public now, like if Hurricane Oliver is coming in, that people use hashtag Hurricane Oliver. Like most of the big storms have named events officially, you know, designated before it hits landfall. Uh, mm -hmm. For smaller, just regional events, you know, you'll still see especially weather enthusiasts like you know, use the WX, like Colorado, C-O-W-X for Colorado weather tweets. Um, and even beyond that, I think it's just, we still see a lot of usage of hashtag floods if that's the topic of the tweet. Um, I haven't done any data science around whether these use of hashtags is going up or down. That, that would be news to me if it was going down. But um, I think people in, when they're specifically tweeting about weather, I think they have other things they just kind of natively attach to that tweet, be it location, be it photos, be it hashtags. Mm -hmm. So is there no way other than really just kind of searching and looking at the popular tweets to figure out like what the best hashtags are to identify this event is kind of just trial and error. Is that Yeah, it's it's, it's a lot of that. Uh, when I, in fact, when I was doing the research around Hurricane Harvey, uh, you know, I started with a really broad set of hashtags, um, mm -hmm. but then, you know, if you go back and looked into our data, you'd see that like within 12 hours, like hashtag Harvey was probably the most common hashtag used. Right. So it does evolve. Uh, if you're really in the business of listening for crowdsourced tweets of interest, you probably want to spread kind of a wider net and then make your own decisions about what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, that makes sense. Um, so there's just a question about academic research and what qualifies as academic research. Is there, can you speak to that? Yeah, uh, first, the most important thing in the doc we shared, there's a link uh, where if you are an academic, it's really tailored for, and I don't really know the reasons behind this, but I think it's because it's new for us and we wanted to start somewhere. Uh, where explicitly uh, the ideal candidate is a grad student or maybe it's a research group at a university. Uh, that's usually all you need to get in. And, and, and we'd want to know more about what you're researching because we just love these ideas and uh, we'll be doing some work to compile and to build sort of a dashboard <clears throat> where you could like, here are 17 academic papers published last month that had to do with Twitter data. Uh, we want to build things like that. Uh, it's been a great process, I think, across the board. Um, you know, if you went back five years ago, it was kind of hard for academics to get access to large amounts of data without spending a lot of grant money. And mm -hmm. I think we've come a long way towards uh, not making that the case. Uh, I can't say there's any, well, I, I asked specifically, is, is it on our roadmap to make it more generally available? Can I be an undergrad who's studying, you know, whatever, something in political science or social science or environmental stuff? I, I have a feeling that's coming, but uh, my colleagues are like, no, we're, we're still scaling up with what we've built so far. Mm -hmm. And it, it has been quite popular. Um, and I'm really happy we're doing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, um, it, there was a comment that came in, more of a comment than a question, but just to show a little bit of the appreciation for that, um, people were talking about the shared experiences and you've emphasized the importance of using Twitter for disaster preparedness and public safety. Um, 
But there is also a wonderful opportunity for, um, you know, sharing experiences of positive events as well. And often I've seen this in the context of nature, um, like seeing double rainbows tweeted in a certain location and then everybody's running to go try to catch it, you know, in, in New York City, for example. Um, or or I, I um, there's someone who tweets about wild animals from camera traps in Arizona and, you know, these, these are really unique opportunities to connect people with nature in positive ways as well. Yeah, um, yeah I, and you must, you must see experiences of that um, or examples rather of that as well. I've made a point of that lately. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're, I don't know if you've heard about these art bots. Uh, uh, a developer here in, De in Boulder has worked a lot with museums to get permissions to tweet out on a daily basis a painting from a famous painter from you know the 1700s or in, in, in you know, a lot of artists you've probably never heard of. I, I definitely have a few of those on my feed. Uh, I love photography. There's some amazing, of course, Twitter accounts where people are just, yeah, to your to what you're saying, posting out, you know, beautiful, you know, nature photography. Uh, my daughter has a strange uh, interest in abandoned buildings. Like, she, it's not like we have any around here, but uh, there's a there's a Twitter account that every day they tweet out some kind of interesting photo of things like that. I mean, you name it. Yes, yes. There's a glacier bot as well that treats out um, repeat photos of melting glaciers, like comparing yeah. 1984 to 2015 yeah. or something, um, which is a, a fascinating use yeah. case as well. Yep, yep. Um, so let me just see, there are um, I, another question here about um, misinformation in the context of extreme weather and how much of a problem is that when you're, you know, trying to get these notifications out? Yeah, I mean, that too is a challenge. I mean, from my experience in working with uh, operators of these flood warning systems and, you know, their, their mode of work is like, okay, if uh, a storm has started, They've activated their emergency management uh, office. Uh, they bring in, you know, all the all the people from the fire departments and the sheriff's departments and the public safety departments, and they usually have a crew who's like using something like TweetDeck or other simple tools to just keep an eye on these type of because there you there will be misinformation. Mm -hmm. I, you know, during the Boulder flood, there was some kind of semi-famous tweet at the time about a 20 foot wall of water coming down Four Mile Canyon. It was totally not true. Mm -hmm. uh, it got a lot of engagement in the first say 20 minutes, but then uh, the agencies kind of responded to it. And then magically it was the, whoever posted it deleted it after half an hour, but it is an issue. And it's something that uh, any of these public safety agencies have to be prepared to react to. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, a lot of these events that I'm focused on are smaller regional events. Mm -hmm. um, and I imagine the scale of information can probably get a lot worse as it becomes more of a national event or, mm -hmm. you know, something that's, you know, a hurricane in Texas, just because it has a wider audience. Mm -hmm. um, but it's certainly something that agencies need to, and there's, that's the thing, there's tools where they can really keep on top of what's coming in, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And, and, but it's sort of like, you have to react to it. it um, right. Yeah. Have to address it. Yeah. Yep. Um, one technical question here, you very quickly in your demo mentioned something about um, the power of sampling or like just checking a few because you can easily hit your daily limit otherwise. Yeah. Can you yeah. just talk a little bit more about that? The, the daily limit and the strategy for, for yeah. doing that? Couple things. Uh, if you're using our search endpoints, which again we call them restful endpoints, it's where you make a request, you get a response back. Uh, often, when you when you type in a query, I want every mention of climate change. You know, you're gonna there's gonna be millions out there, and we can only return up to 500 at a time. So, one technique is to sort of just obviously meter and keep track of how many responses are coming back. Um, but more importantly, there's what we call these counts endpoints where you can use the exact same queries, same time frame, and you can actually count and know how many tweets are associated with your query. So then you can fine tune your query. You can 
you know, maybe if you're like doing real time streaming, you could say, I really only want original tweets from people who have more than a thousand followers. I don't know why you do that. Cause actually in times of floods, you shouldn't really care how many followers somebody has. They might have, you know, 20 followers, but just took an amazing photo that could, uh, you know, be actionable. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the point being that with search, you can look before you leap. You can you can craft your query. You can ask how many tweets would match if you collected the data. That doesn't count towards your you know two million tweets a month or whatever. And you can use that to a learn how these different ways of building queries can kind of help you focus on the on the data and and get rid of the noise. Mm -hmm. That's an important thing. Another thing when you're real time streaming, we have a a separate mechanism called sampling. You can say, I want to apply these filters in real time, but I only want to apply it on the 10% sample of the fire hose. So you can start really small hmm. and you could set up these queries, you know, because the thing about real time streaming, you can have up to a quarter million filters in place at one time hmm. that are just magically applied to the real time fire hose and we stream you within seconds, whatever matches. So you can build your queries with the sample operator and say, I have no idea what the, this will collect. I'm gonna start with the 1% sample say, and you can up that as, you know, all the way to 100%, obviously. So that's another real key way to just be careful because there's, you know, there's, I don't know, 15, well, yeah, like 15 billion tweets a month. Uh, you can um. run, <laughs> you can, you know, 6,000 tweets per second, you could run through your quota quite quickly. So there are tools to help you, um, some to provide some uh, guardrails against just swamping uh, your system. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, let me just ask you a little bit more open-ended question here um, and we'll, we'll wrap up soon, but just based on what you've seen, are there particular areas of research maybe related to extreme weather disasters or a little bit beyond that you think is, are just really rich domains specifically for investigating where you'd like to see more research? Yeah, I mean, I've been advocating now for quite a while about how our local county city, even state agencies could really, you know, harness this power of Twitter in terms of, you know, again, crowdsourcing observations coming in. I'd love to, I mean, I think a lot of agencies think it's like really difficult technically, but mm -hmm. uh, as an advocate, I'd say it's not the case. You could literally probably hire an intern who's in computer science and build what you need. Uh, it's pretty, in my mind, pretty straightforward stuff. Mm -hmm. um, what what I'm what's kind of new to me is like that research we highlighted shortly about just understanding how people are talking about these problems and and are we like the the frog in the boiling water where you know oh it just seems normal we have fires up every month of the year um, I, th I find that type of research uh, fascinating um, and obviously there's probably tons of research going on around misinformation around environmental challenges. And um, so I, I don't know, I think in my mind, like I always go back to the thought that when I first started working with Twitter data, I had no idea that you could find a data signal that is relevant to your particular interest. I mean, there's just such a volume mm -hmm. of conversation that, I mean, I'd be surprised if you could find a use case where it's not you know, there's not some signal that you could learn from on Twitter. Mm -hmm. But along with that, you know, there's a lot of challenges. And I would say with our version two, uh, one improvement is around spam. Um, how we are improving our filtering at a higher level so you don't have to deal with what looks like obvious spam. Mm -hmm. It's funny because I work with a lot of data partners. They want to do that on their own. Like one person's spam is another person's like tweet of interest. Uh, of <laughs> so anyway, um, there are challenges, but there's just so much data. It just blows my mind. Yeah. Well, I want to encourage people to go visit um, the extreme weather visualizations that you mentioned, Jim, because I think one of the things I've really learned is yeah, the richness and multidimensionality of some of these conversations and looking at the progression of how an event unfolds. And I'm thinking of the Texas freeze one and in there yeah. is 
you know, that famous picture of someone ceiling fan with ice, you know, coming off it and, yep, yep. Um, and just all the different events that that sort of erupted as it was unfolding and what we can learn from that about how people perceive these events, how they respond to them, how we can learn and do better next time. Yeah, um, there's, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of material, but I think your uh, metaphor of the fire hose is apt. That's how it kind of feels. So learning to drink from the fire hose and to get some meaning out of the data coming out of the fire hose is clearly the challenge. Um, and sure. I really appreciate you helping us do that a little bit better and, and helping to articulate that it, it may seem a little bit more overwhelming than it is in reality um, because it's within reach and the work that you and your colleagues have done is really making that possible. Um, yeah. Yeah. So thank, thank you so much. Yeah. Well, you're very welcome. And I, I will stress again, if, if, if you're new to the Twitter APIs, if you're new to coding, that some of those no code tools are really a great place to start just to understand what it's all about. Like what, what kind of query, I mean, you should know there's 50 different things you can build your query with that are really should help you tune into what you consider tweets of interest and to cut back on noise. So. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And with that, I will turn it over just for a few last um, words from Tom. Thank you again, Jim. Thank yes, you. thank you. I'd just like to extend a warm round of applause to our speaker, uh, Mr. Jim Moffat, as well as Dr. Jennifer Marlin. Um, both of you have had a phenomenal discussion today, and I hope, or I'm actually fairly certain based on the amount of people that were following along the, on the doc that we, uh, we learned a lot. And I will say, um, drinking from the hose is a great phrase, and we will <laughs> we will be keeping that one in the back pocket um, for future use. Um, I'd also like to ex uh, extend a special thank you to Topher Allen uh, here at Yale University for his efforts in organizing all of the logistics behind this event. Um, and just as a quick um, couple housekeeping things, uh, everyone should receive in about a week or so a follow-up email with a recording for this event as well as a written description. So if anyone didn't have a chance to attend today's event, um, please feel free to forward that to them. And then um, also please keep an eye out for any announcements about our upcoming events the fall. This sadly was the last speaker series event we're having this spring, but we will be back strong again in the fall next year. So please keep an eye out for that. Thanks so much.